Hey, 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 hey. Welcome to my channel. Yesterday, I was trying to catch up on some of the facts about Debbie Collier's um, death. Okay, I'll put it that way. Actually, no. Yesterday, the, the police said it was a murder investigation. It is a homicide. I was trying to catch up on all of the facts of that, and I did a pretty quick reading it was only about 15 minutes long, and I got a shit ton of information. So I shared a picture of my notes that I took during my reading on my community tab earlier. We're going to go over a couple things that they said in some of these news videos. And then the last part of the video, we're going to go over my notes, and I'm going to explain what all of my chicken scratches mean. <laughs> I made a playlist on my channel here. I have 13 different videos in here. And this was the first video that I watched and it was from nine days ago, but I just looked all this stuff up within the last two days. I started watching Annie Elise's videos two days ago, um, the, the channel Tend to Life. And then yesterday I started digging deeper into some of the news videos. I wanted to see longer clips of Debbie's daughter, Amanda. Because Amanda and her boyfriend, Andrew, were really giving me a weird energy, a weird vibe. This is the first one. Let's go ahead and watch this this here. And I'm going to interject just a little bit as we get through it. All right, let's get to our other top story tonight. What happened to Deborah Collier? This mystery is gaining national attention tonight as new details reveal the Athens woman's tragic final moments. More than a week after her body was found in Habersham County, about an hour away from her home, a police report reveals the exact details of the crime scene. And a warning, folks, they are very disturbing. 11 Alive's Cody Alcorn has been following this case very closely. And Cody, investigators did reveal one new detail in the past few hours, but basically a lot of red flags with this entire story. No yeah, doubt about that, Jennifer. Sure. Start with a random Venmo text to her daughter where she transferred $2,300 to her Venmo account with this cryptic message that said, they won't let me go. Also, in the missing persons report, her daughter said her mom has never ran away, wasn't suicidal. She was, in fact, the front office manager for an Athens real estate company. I remember reading, because I've read a couple different articles also, and I remember reading somewhere that Amanda first claimed in one of her statements to the police, that she was with her mother at the Dollar General. When the news reporters asked about that during the presser Friday morning, yesterday morning, they didn't really clarify that. All he said was the cashier at the, at the Family Dollar store said, Debbie was the only one here. The mother was the one here. And he said that I even showed her pictures of mother and daughter, and she confirmed it was only the mother. So why in the hell did Amanda put out any type of information that would place her at the Family Dollar store with her mom? But her saying that she was there first, when I did my reading, that really resonated with me. And I'm going to explain to you why when we get to my reading. Let's keep going. No reason to leave. So why would she just pick up and take off? Let's walk through some of the other bizarre aspects of this case. Lots of bizarre aspects. Collier was reported missing on the evening of September 10th. Her husband, who she lives with at their Athens home, told police he last saw Collier before they went to bed at 9 p.m. the night before. Okay, let me put out right, right off the bat. I do not feel or believe that Steve is involved in Debbie's death in any way, shape, or form at all period. I believe that he has zero knowledge of how she passed or any of that. So I wanted to put that on the table first. He told the Athens Clark County police the two don't sleep in the same room because he snores. The next day he told them he got up and left for work. Collier's daughter said the next afternoon she got a Venmo transfer from her mom for $2,385 along with a message that said quote they're not going to let me go. Love you. Now this part right here. The message said they are. There's no contractions in this at all. If I was going to send this message, I would say they are not going to let me go. Period. And then a simple love you. That's it. Who is they? And if they aren't going to let you go, why would it just be love you? Like, that's very simple and basic and... That doesn't sound like the last text. 
And that doesn't sound like the last words that you would say to your child. Uh, no. Okay, so the reason why I brought up, you know, it says they are not instead of they are not or they aren't is because back when the West Boys were reported missing, one of the things that I learned doing um, research about body language and verbiage during interviews and interrogations and things like that, that liars don't use contraction words like they they're very they talk very slow. They want to make sure that they're not putting out any lies. They think about things before they say them because they want you to believe them. They want it to make sense. They're the way that they look certain ways. If they look to the right, up, middle, or down, it's because they're trying to remember what the lie was or they're trying to make up a lie in their mind. If they're looking to the left, they're actually remembering what really happened. And that's if the person is right-handed, okay? And that's not all the time. It's just something that they have found common in liars. When somebody says, to be honest, or actually, or basically, or honestly, that means that they're about to tell you a lie. Because why would you say, to be honest, and I know we talked about this when we were talking about, um, in the Kylie Rodney case, we were talking about Nick, the a uh, roadside assistance guy, he said, to be honest, okay, well, does that mean that you haven't been honest the rest of this interview? So it's things like that. To be honest, honestly, I've heard um, a few different law enforcement personnel say anytime that they say a word that it ends in L-Y, that means that they're about to lie. Actually, basically, honestly, you know, things like that. That's why I wanted to point that out. They are not when I was writing this quote down on my on my notes to do my reading yesterday, I was like, there's not one single word, not one word. It says, they are not going to let me go. Love you. There is a key to the house in the blue flower pot by the door. And there's no periods. There's no commas. There's no capital letter anywhere. And I just find that weird. And it was sent, this Venmo was sent at 3.17 p.m., while Debbie was sitting in the parking lot at Family Dollar, she went into the store at 2.54 p.m. She came out at 3.10 p.m. The Venmo was sent at 3.17 p.m. And she pulled out of the parking lot at 3.19 p.m. So she sat there for almost 10 minutes. So if that was the case, she sent that message two minutes before she pulled away stating they are not going to let me go and to send almost $2,400 to her daughter, leaving her $10 in her account. It doesn't make sense, or does it? Bizarre indeed. On Sunday, September 11th, the rental van she was driving was tracked down 60 miles north to Habersham County. Her daughter said she had rented the van because she had wrecked her car. Authority. Why was she so far away from home? 60 miles away from home to go buy a tarp, a poncho, paper towel, a lighter. Why would she do that? Why would she be up in that area? Especially if a game that she was going to or going to watch, which I still don't have clarity on that yet. The game started at four. Why would she go that far away and leave the the parking lot at 319 was she planning on watching the game or attending the, the game does anybody know that i haven't heard those details either if you haven't heard about debbie collier yet i'm sorry i kind of jumped right into it like everybody had already heard about her but um she was she's from athens georgia she's a 59 year old mom and wife and she was she has a, a daughter and a son. Her son lives in Maryland. Her daughter had just moved back to Georgia from Maryland on Thursday. She had lunch with her daughter on Friday. Then she had dinner with her daughter and um, her daughter's boyfriend, who the daughter and the daughter's boyfriend have had some major problems between the two of them. The daughter has pretty lengthy history of some DV, okay? She's not very friendly to her men's. Let's just put it that way. She was last seen on September 10th on Saturday, 
at Family Dollar, and then she was found partially nude, burned, and deceased in a ravine on Sunday, September 11th. That's kind of the, the gist of it there. Her daughter, Amanda Bearden, and her boyfriend's name is Andrew something, I forget. I think that it talks about it in the, the video. Um, I want to see if it's this one. Debbie Collier murder. Daughter who received $2.3,000 Venmo before mom's murder has criminal history. Amanda Bearden, the daughter of slain Georgia office manager Debbie Collier, has a lengthy rap sheet. Georgia police have not yet publicly identified any suspects in the search for whoever killed Debbie Collier, a 59-year-old real estate office manager who police found stripped naked, burned, and dumped at the bottom of a hill in the woods a day after her family reported her missing earlier this month. Amanda Bearden, Collier's 36-year-old daughter, and husband Stephen Collier filed a missing person report on Sept. Bearden, who Fox News Digital has learned is well known to her hometown police department, has a rap sheet going back more than a decade for numerous domestic violence calls involving different men with whom she has been romantically involved, according to reports obtained by Fox News Digital. This picture right here is one of Amanda's old mugshots. And then the picture of the male that we just saw, that was Andrew. I apologize if there's any background noise. There's a lot going on in my house right now, so I apologize. She's had, she's had a record. Okay, we'll just, we'll put it that way. We don't need to watch the whole thing there. So in 2012, Amanda got arrested because she was physically hurting um, her current man at that time. And they had only been living together for two months. She was put on probation and her probation was revoked when she was trying to give a false urine sample. She had brought in either fake or somebody else's or something to try to pass her drug screen. Well, that didn't work out too well because she got caught. Okay, then we go to 2021, and here's his name on the screen right here, Andrew Geikrich, however you say that. So now I want to go to this one. Brand new details tonight in the mysterious and gruesome death of Athens mom, Debbie Collier. New surveillance video shows Collier buying the very items that police would find just hours later next to her burned naked body. Tonight, only on 11 Alive News, the clerk in that video who was seen checking Collier out reacts to the fact that she might be the last person to see her alive. Debbie Collier's body was found on Sunday, September 11th. This video you're about to watch was captured 21 hours earlier, 13 miles north of the crime scene, showing Collier buying the items that ultimately led deputies to her body. That was the other thing. She was only 13 miles away. That family dollar store was only 13 miles away from where she was found deceased. Now watch in the video and we'll see she walks in with her red jersey on. That's very important. Let, let's watch this first before I tell you all that. On Saturday, September 10th at 2.55 p.m., the Habersham County Sheriff's Office confirms this is Debbie Collier. Captured on video, walking into the family dollar in Clayton, Georgia. The red bag. She's wearing a red visor, a Paper black towel. box across her chest, and appears to have her rental key fob in hand. The video jumps to call your checking out. On the counter, a red tote bag. She then places a blue tarp, rain poncho, paper towels, and a refillable torch lighter on the counter. I do remember her. I remember checking her out, but I really don't remember like what we talked about. I talked to the clerk who checked out Collier. Esther Kreller told me over the phone, the items Collier bought didn't set off any red flags. Kreller said Collier didn't act like anything was wrong. She didn't seem in distress. Knowing what she does today. I nothing looked up suspicious or out of the ordinary nobody i wish i would have went outside you know around that time who would have thought 21 hours later collier's body would be found naked and burned along with that tarp and red tote bag 13 miles away no they said that she was partially naked she wasn't fully nude but they haven't given us much more description than that um actually hold on just a minute so I have the police report right here, and on this page, I don't believe that she was fully nude, though. Here, he observed a nude female laying on her back and grasping a small tree. I don't believe that she was fully nude, just from what, what I feel, from... Maybe that's something that I gathered intuitively and I was mistaken thinking that I read it or heard it someplace else.
I just remembered that I had that police report and I haven't read it in full. So I just skimmed it real quick to see, but that's what it says there. She was in fact nude. Okay, let me get to the next video. This is where Amanda said that she was at the Family Dollar. And this was on September 28th, and it's from Fox 5 Atlanta. This is Debbie Collier walking into a Family Dollar in Clayton, Georgia on Saturday, September 10th. It's just before 3 p.m., only hours before Collier's husband reported her missing. In this security camera video, you can see her picking up several things, including a rain poncho, a tarp, paper towels, and a torch lighter. The Habersham County Sheriff's Department says this clue is crucial. A spokesman tells Fox 5 News all of those items were found here at the crime scene the next day, next to Collier's nude body with burn marks on it. They didn't know how they got there. Now they do. Also, they now know Collier was still alive at three that afternoon. But here's the added twist. In a statement, investigators say over the weekend, Collier's daughter, Amanda Bearden, told them she was at the Clayton Family Dollar that Saturday. A review of security video and interviews so far hasn't backed that claim up. There is where it was. So Amanda Bearden told law enforcement that she was at the Family Dollar on Saturday. How does that make any sense? Unless she was there before her mom was there. Maybe, right? Okay, I want the interview and the 911 calls. Because Amanda called 911 a couple different times. Steve made the initial phone call. There's one quote that he says in that 911 call that I want you to hear. And then I want you to hear what Amanda says. And then we're going to go into my reading. This is the first call that Amanda made. This is not Steve's call, but I will play that for you before we do my reading. This was her first call when she calls in to 911, and this is on a channel called True Crime Reacts with Jules. Let's start. She did a great job. She transcribed the call, which makes it so much easier. Um, hi, um, my name is Amanda Bearden, and um, I thought that a missing person report on my mother last night, uh, yesterday, excuse me, and I was just wondering if maybe I could speak with the detective that's been assigned to the case. Do you have any further information? I sure do. Um, I mean, do you want do you want the case number? I mean, I, I have the case number, so I can look it up that way. Okay, so when when the dispatch asked her, do you have any further information on the case? And she said, um, I sure do. I don't think she was saying, hey, look, I got new information that I need to give to the detective. I think she was saying, well, yeah, I know all about the case because it's my mom. Do you want the case number? Like, what do you need to know about this? Yes, this is a case that I'm very heavily involved with. So I don't think that she was calling to say, look, I got new information. I need to tell him because then later you're going to hear dispatch say, what is the new information that you need to relate to the detective? And she's going to be like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't have new information. She was not saying I have new information. She was saying, I know all of the information about the case because it's my mom. But I also feel like this was a fishing expedition. She is trying to talk to the detective to get information about what they know. Who would do that? I mean, this is the, the victim's daughter, okay? So I do give her a little bit of leeway there. But usually the perpetrator is the one that's trying to dig the deepest, right? Or be right in the middle, lead the pack, Sammy Smith. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, like that just, just my opinion. Okay. All right, let's keep going. Um, just a second. I'm sorry. That's okay. Yes, um, two, zero, two, three, two, three, two, three, um, Zero And the detective may not actually be in the building yet, so I may have to get your patrol officer, okay? So just bear with me just a second. Okay. Zero nine one zero. I'm sorry, his handwriting is not that great, but it's zero nine one zero zero two one six. You're fine, it's only me. On Rocky Drive. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And what kind of update do you have? Just so I know what to try to. Oh no, I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean like I had an update. I just meant. Oh, oh my God! I didn't mean. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm not in a clear mental state. Okay. I, I mean, this is not my business. Um, I just, I just wanted to talk to them. I wanted to see if maybe 
there was something that I could do. I do have the rental agreement number if they needed that. Um, I mean, that's the only thing that I, I have to offer. So maybe because she was in a rental car, I do have her rental. I understand she's the victim's daughter. Okay, I totally get that. And I'm saying this with that in mind. She goes into the crying mode in hopes that it won't make her look bad, you know, because she's trying to dig. So her immediate act goes up and the tears are made to sound like they're coming out, in my opinion, allegedly. What do you think? Do you think that this is a, a sincere, curious daughter wanting answers about her mother's death? Or is this a perpetrator trying to dig? What you think? Let me know in the comment. Well, agreement number. If they could maybe change the GPS, do it. What's your number? I'm her daughter. Yes, ma'am. Take a deep breath on me, okay? I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. I'd be upset to you. I completely understand that part, like being upset about it. Um, so the officer that took your report is already gone for the day. Um, he worked last night. And then the detectives, I don't think they're in the building right now. They're kind of working on an on-call basis, so I don't know that I can get in touch with them and, unless I have something, you know, fresh to give them. And that would be something. But I can see if I can get another officer to call you back, okay? Okay. Um, and we've got the bolo out for, we're like, we got everybody, you know, keeping our eyes peeled for and that kind of thing. So, um, um Okay, this was the day after they had reported her missing. So they reported her missing on Saturday the 10th, and she was found on Sunday the 11th in the afternoon. Okay, I have the timeline and everything written down. Maybe I should grab that. I wrote this timeline down as I was watching the presser that happened yesterday morning. I'll run through the whole timeline that we know of from beginning to end. Thursday, September 8th, Amanda moved home to Georgia from Maryland. Friday the 9th, Amanda and Debbie had lunch. Friday the 9th, Debbie, Amanda, and Andrew had dinner. Friday evening, the neighbors heard yelling females from Debbie's house. 9 p.m. on Friday the 9th was the last time that Steve, Debbie's husband, saw her when they went to bed because they sleep in different rooms because Steve snores. Then Saturday, the 10th, Steve leaves for work, and he was um, confirmed clocked in at work from 9 a.m. until 4.06 p.m. Works at the Optimist Club. Now, Amanda and Debbie spoke on the phone sometime in the afternoon at the presser. The officer didn't have his notes so that he didn't have the exact time, but they did speak on the phone in the afternoon. Then at 2.17 p.m., Debbie was seen driving north on Georgia 15, on Highway 15, in the Pacifica van in front of Tallulah School. At 2.54 p.m., Debbie was walked into the Family Dollar. At 3.10 p.m., Debbie walks out of the Family Dollar, and then she sat in her vehicle. At 3.17, seven minutes later, she sent that almost $2,400 through Venmo to Amanda with that weird ass message. And then at 319, Debbie pulls out a family dollar parking lot. She was going southbound towards LaFaz on Georgia 15, and she was alone in the van. That was validated by law enforcement. Amanda claims that when she got that message with the Venmo, that she started driving around looking for her mother in places she thought she could be. Instead of calling the police or telling somebody who they might be, she drove to Walmart and Ulta and other locations. And she's looking for a rental vehicle. Debbie was in a rental vehicle. She wasn't even in her own vehicle. A black Pacifica it was a 2022. I mean, that's a common vehicle, right? So, I wow, that... Bullshit. Okay, bullshit. Bullshit. I, hmm, I don't believe that shit at all. So then at 4.06 p.m., Steve gets off work. At 4 p.m., the Georgia Bulldogs game starts. And then around 5 p.m.-ish, law enforcement saw a black Pacifica pulled off on Georgia 15 northbound near Victory Home Lane, which is the exact spot 
that it was parked on Sunday where they found Debbie. At 6.01 p.m., Steve called 911. At 6.08 p.m., law enforcement showed up at Steve's house to take the report. On Sunday, the 11th, that 5 p.m. sighting was filed. At 12.28 p.m., Cirrus XM pinged the vehicle to Georgia 15. At 12.44, they located the crime scene, and it was a quarter of a mile away from the road. At 3.09 p.m., Debbie was identified and a, a crime scene was established. Now, Amanda showed up to the crime scene after they found the Pacifica, but I believe before they found Debbie. When Amanda showed up, she was hysterical. I mean, unless she knew the license plate, I don't understand how she would drive around Walmart parking lot or Ulta or like, why would you go start driving to different locations after you got that specifically worded Venmo message? That makes no sense to me. I feel like this was a complete setup. I'm not trying to be a smart aleck here or anything, but do I need to hire a private detective, maybe? Because I, 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 I mean, and I'm not trying to be ugly or anything, but it, 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 I don't understand why some, I mean, I, I know you don't know everything, of course, but why it hasn't, what I've asked being done, like why isn't the GPS and your van being traced? Do I, do I need a private detective to do that? I mean, I just, I don't, I'm not trying to be ugly or anything. I know. I just, the most help. Okay, so here's the thing. She's, she's an, like, what, what is she? She's an adult. Right. Okay. So that makes things a little more difficult because people are allowed to leave and go and do things without telling other people. And I know that's not a good answer. I understand that. But that is also, you know, that is also part of it because she is an adult. So it just, it just takes some time also to do these things. And so I don't I don't specifically know what they've done yet or not. I wasn't here last night, so I don't know. But um, I, from my understanding, they would be doing everything that we know to do currently. But I will definitely get somebody to call you back, okay? Okay, thank you for talking to me. Oh, I, no problem, ma'am. I'm so sorry. I, I hate that this is happening to you. What was your name again, sweetie? Amanda Bearden. Amanda Bearden. So your last name? B-E-A-R-D-E-N. Okay. All right, I'll get somebody to call you back here shortly, okay? Thank you so much. Right, thank you. Bye-bye. That was the end of the first call that she had made to 911. I understand, like I said, from the, the daughter of the victim... At this point, Debbie is still missing. They don't know where she is. She's wanting them to get the car pinged, the location pinged. I fully understand that. But I also feel something sinister about it. And I, I can't I can't change that feeling. I try to put myself in her place. Okay, if my mom was missing, if I got that message from my mom, I would be flipping the f*** out. Okay, like I would be calling everybody that I knew. I would be calling law enforcement. I would be, I mean, who is they? Debbie, obviously, if that Venmo came from Debbie, okay, if that Venmo came from Debbie, which I don't believe that it did, but if it did, they would imply that Amanda already knows who Debbie is with. They aren't letting me go. Here's all my money. And the key to my house is in a flower pot. Now, did Amanda know that the key was in the flower, flower pot before she got that message? I bet you she did. Just my opinion. We're going to listen to what Steve says at the very beginning of this 911 call. Yes. Uh, hey, Mom, my wife was at home. Her driver's license is still in there. The rental car is gone. And... Her daughter's here, and we were kind of worried about what's happening and where she's at. I was wanting to send somebody over here. First, he says, and her daughter is here. It makes it sound like when he got home, Amanda was already there at the house, right? Okay, then he says, 
she has no medical issues, so I guess. And according to her daughter, who went up and uh, took birth control here with her driver's license. The only thing is... Her daughter went up. And her purse is still here with her driver's license. Then he says later on, let me skip forward here. And this is on Tend to Life channel. Would she be going to somebody's house or? That's a good question. I thought she was out shopping for food. Her daughter came over with that strange message and then went up the stairs to her bedroom and found out that uh, uh, her driver's license and credit card is still here. So, her daughter went up to her bedroom. So Amanda was at the house before Steve got home, allegedly. That's what I'm gathering from this. Amanda went upstairs, factually, and Amanda's the one that found her driver's license, her credit cards, and a purse, which obviously wasn't the purse that Debbie was carrying when she was murdered because the purse she had on in that Family Dollar surveillance video was found at the scene. Was the credit card that she used at Family Dollar one of the things that was found at the house by Amanda? Hmm. That's a big question for me. Okay. Very big question. Now, I want to get to the last thing before we go into my reading. Amanda talking on the news. I found where... Law enforcement said that she was partially nude. This is the lead top dog law enforcement officer over Debbie's case. Search resulted in the locating of a red tote bag, a partially burnt blue and color tarp, and eventually the victim's partially nude and burnt body grasping a small tree down a ravine. Okay, there we go. So she was partially nude, according to him. Now we're getting ready to see the interview that Amanda did with the news. Somebody took my whole world from me. Debbie's daughter, Amanda. Do you see any tears? I mean, that's a hell of a face to make, and I don't see a tear. I'm just curious. I know anytime somebody cries, we've been taught by true crime, true crime knowledge to look at body language. She doesn't have a tear on her face. <laughs> Debbie's daughter, Amanda, and her stepfather, Stephen, reported her mother missing on the evening of September 10th. Stephen said he'd seen his wife the night before and that her rental was still in the driveway when he left for work that morning. I started going to all the different places that I thought she would go, like Walmart, Ulta. I mean, I drove around for at least two hours. And here's a little bit more body language. Amanda's sitting there shaking her head no the entire time she is saying that she drove around for at least two hours at Walmart and Ulta and just any places she could think of. Um, she's shaking her head no, which is denying the statement that she is currently making. Let's watch that one more time, why don't we? I started going to all the different places that I thought. She would go, like, Walmart, Ulta. I mean, I drove around for at least two hours. Her phone data is going to be so instrumental in this case. Because if she got that Venmo at 3.17 p.m., she drove around, in air quotations, for at least two hours. And then she ended up back at Debbie and Steve's. And Steve calls 911 at 6.01 p.m. Was Amanda in the house before Steve got there? Or was Steve home and Amanda showed up? I have the feeling, the way that he worded things, was that he got home and she was there, and she had already been upstairs and found a purse and Debbie's driver's license and credit cards. Let's watch that that little part one more time here. I wait when he left for work that morning. I started going to... All the different places that I thought she would go, like Walmart, Ulta. When she said, I drove around, she looked to the right. Then when she said that she went to places that she thought Debbie would go to, she looked to the left. Okay, so that's, that's again, validity right there of what I said about when, allegedly, 
somebody is telling a lie, they look to the right. When they're going off of memory, they look to the left. So she looked to the right because she didn't really drive her ass around town looking for her mother because she knew exactly where she was, in my opinion, allegedly. But she looked to the left because she was going off of memory, thinking about the places where Debbie did often go. Okay, let's watch that one more time. Driveway when he left for work that morning. I started going to... To the right? All the different places that I thought she would go, like Walmart. To the left? Uh, I mean, I drove around for at least two hours. At 317 that afternoon, Amanda told police she received $2,385 from her mom via Venmo. The money transfer included a message that said, quote, They're not going to let me go. Love you. There is a key to the house in the blue flower pot by the door. Door. Immediate hysterical. Um, I've never been through this before. When authorities located Debbie's car, they found a red tote bag down an embankment. A so they probably said, what was your reaction when you found this, you know, when you got that message from your mom or what was your reaction to all of this, you know, the whole situation? And that was her answer. Immediate hysteria. I've never been through this before. Interesting. Partially burnt tarp and Debbie's clothless body. She was a beautiful, kind, giving woman. And she didn't deserve, she didn't deserve any of this. Amanda says the last time she saw her mom was Friday night. They ate dinner, ran some errands, and went home separately. She had this message for her mother's killer. I just want them to rot in hell. I do, sir. I, I mean, it, it's not going to take my pain away. I know it's not. But I want justice for my mom. She said, that's all I want. At the end of that, they cut her voice off there. That's a lot, right? That's a lot. She didn't deserve this. What didn't she deserve? She was already at the scene when they found Debbie. I wonder what law enforcement told her when they found Debbie. <laughs> All right, let's wrap this shit up here with my reading. Here's my notes. My sloppy notes. My chicken scratches. So if you've ever seen my notes before, this is how I do it. I know I have a lot of new subscribers and welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. And my OGs, what's up? My OG squad. Okay, so when I do a reading, I usually try to write like the basic facts at the very top of the page. This one I wrote a little bit extra because that Venmo really stood out to me. The timeline really stood out to me. And then I always put the last scene information up there. The age, the birthday where they're from, stuff like that. Law enforcement agency to contact because they're usually missing. Um, all of that usually goes right up at the very, very top of the page. So on this one, no different. I put that she sent Amanda the 2385 Benmo with the message that said they are not going to let me go. Love you. There is a key to the house in the blue flower pot by the door and I read it like that because that's how it that's how it is it's all single words they are not there's no periods there's no commas there's no capital letters I don't believe that this came from Debbie and I don't know how Debbie types I've never seen any of her other messages this is just my assumption then I wrote that she's a 59 year old mom of Amanda and Jeffrey Amanda's boyfriend is Andrew and then she has a wife to Steve that she was at Family Dollar at 2.54 p.m. until 3.10 p.m. She sent the Venmo at 3.17 p.m. And she left the parking lot at 3.19 p.m. She was last seen on September 10th, Saturday at Family Dollar. She was found nude, burned, and deceased on Sunday the 11th. Okay, so then I always put what I hear, what I gathered, what I saw, what I felt physically, emotionally. Like I said, this was only like a 10 minute reading. This was so quick, so quick. Okay. So we're going to start off with what I gathered because I feel like this is the most information right here. What I gathered from the entire reading, Amanda has guilty knowledge. I do not believe that Amanda was there when Debbie was killed, but I do believe that Andrew might have been allegedly there when Debbie was killed. 
And now he has a tight hold on Amanda, saying things to her like, you can't tell because you helped set this up. If I'm going down, you're going down with me. You know, something like that. Because I also heard that he did an interview. I saw a clip or something of him standing on the side of the road that said that that they barricaded themselves in the house. They had stuff in front of the front door and the back door. We sleep with stuff in front of our back door and our front door because yeah, no, we I'm didn't not... have anything to do with this. So we're a little scared ourselves. No. We had nothing to do with this. So we're just no, I know. I bet. ourselves at this point. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, Andrew was fed up. Like, I feel his energy was just done, done. Like, he wasn't just done. He was done, done. Okay? Debbie was such a sweet woman. I mean, she was only 5'5". Five, five, okay? She was a short lady. 5 feet, 5 inches. But I feel strength from that woman. Like, she is what held the family together. She is the glue. She is the go-to. She's there to bail you out. She's there to help you. She's there to rescue you. She always has the right answer. If not, she'll find it. She'll figure it out. That's what I, that's the energy that I get from Debbie. She wanted the best for her daughter. Her daughter had been in a lot of trouble and it was anger that seemed to get her in that trouble, allegedly, right? getting physical with her men and not being able to control her anger and Debbie wanted that to stop she wanted she wanted Amanda to not do drugs she wanted her to be clean and sober she wanted her to be a productive citizen of society I mean so much so that when Amanda moved back on Thursday from Maryland to Georgia that I guarantee it wasn't Steve's idea for Amanda to live in a property that Steve owns. I guarantee it. I I feel a lot of friction between Amanda and Steve. A lot. Because I feel like Steve was frustrated that Debbie was always there. Anytime Amanda said jump, Debbie jumped. Meaning anytime Amanda called and said, Mom, I'm in jail. Mom, I need money. Mom, I'm hungry. Debbie jumped. And Steve was frustrated with it all. He was so fed up and frustrated with it. But he assisted because Debbie was the love of his life. You know, she, that's his wife. And that's his wife's daughter. I mean, he was very clear on that 911 call. That's my stepdaughter. Okay. He was very specific about that. So that added to my my feeling, my vibe that I'm getting all of that friction between Amanda and Steve. And I also don't think that Steve appreciated the way that Amanda treated Debbie. Now, back to my notes here. Andrew controlled Amanda, but Amanda was sneaky, okay? Sneaky. Andrew liked to have control of everything, but Amanda was sneaking shit ar ar around behind his back. She was doing shit that he had no idea that she was doing. None. Just sneaky. Which means she's used to lying. She lied to Andrew. She lied to her mom. She's used to lying. But I feel like she's going to be the one to crack. Next was Debbie just wanted a calm relationship with Amanda. And she had high hopes when Amanda moved home on Thursday. She was excited about Amanda moving home. Whatever Amanda told her. I don't know if Amanda was in a good situation or a bad situation in Maryland. But whatever she told Debbie about wanting to come home, Debbie was excited about it. And she she had high hopes that Amanda was going to get things back on track. That's that's why I think that this like mm, this hurts me. This really hurts me. Like I mm -hmm. De this was the last thing. I mean, nobody expects to be murdered, but this was the polar opposite of what I feel like Debbie was expecting. She wasn't expecting this friction, period. She was let down on Friday when Amanda let her down, when she found out that Andrew was also around. And I think that's why they got into their argument Friday evening when the neighbors heard them arguing at Debbie's house. 
Amanda will crack and or slip up and the truth will come out. Okay, whether they figure it out from Amanda's phone data that she's not being honest about where she was, where she went, who sent the, the money, the message, where it was sent from. They said that they still don't know which device it was sent from. When Amanda called 911 the second time, she called back in because she had missed um, the detective's phone call. And when she called back in, she said that she had her mom's Apple ID. And then she said she had a password that she thought was the correct one, but it's not working for some reason. But she has the Apple ID. Uh, yes, ma'am. I, I just I thought about it, and I have her iCloud information. I, I know that it, it's a, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if the phone is turned off, it would still track her. Um, but I, I do have her. I've got her Apple ID and what I thought was her password, but the password isn't working. I, I don't know if y'all have technology or whatever, but I, I do have. I, I I don't know. I'm just. I mean, you know. I, Right, hold on one second. I believe she knows the password, too. And I believe that that was a lie about the password not working. In my opinion, allegedly, Debbie wants Amanda to step up and be honest. She wants her to come forward. She, the, the energy that I got from Debbie was like, do this last thing for me. I have done everything for you. Do this last thing for me. And come forward and be honest. That's what I got from my reading. That's the feeling that I got when I was doing this reading. Now we're going to go through with what I heard. And then I think that what I just read to you from Gathered, I think that that will make more sense then. The first thing that I heard was drama. It seemed like there was always drama around when Amanda was around greedy. Amanda wanted money. Okay, why did Amanda want money? Because there were drugs involved. But how did she get it? She lied. Drugs. Liar. Bad trio. Bad trio. Debbie, Amanda, and Andrew were the bad trio. Debbie was very disappointed in many things. Many of the choices that Amanda had made. And then I got control. Andrew is all about that control, baby. And I think Amanda is partially for blame in the control area also. I think that she wants control too, but Andrew usually gets it, I think. Fights between Amanda and Andrew, fights between Amanda and Debbie were over Andrew. Amanda equals trouble. Debbie was in fear for Amanda. Now, these are words that I'm hearing, okay? Like, I hear the words spoken. Debbie was in fear that Amanda was going to either get hurt or she was going to take her aggression too far. But then, so I was in that, that moment, that energy circle, I guess is the best way to describe it, of Debbie, or spirit, I guess, showing me Debbie, Amanda, and Andrew. Like their relationship, the way that things were going between them. But then I immediately was shown Debbie in the woods. Then I started feeling fearful. The spot where Debbie was was a familiar spot. Like maybe she had met up with Amanda in that location before. That was a, a random location. She didn't just randomly pick that location that day. I believe she had been there before. Then I heard Amanda and I heard trapped in fear and I heard, you did this and busted. Okay, all of those came in all at the same time. Amanda, you did this. Not physically did this, but ultimately did this. Trapped in fear was like, Debbie was trapped. She couldn't get away. She could not get out. And I'm going to give you more detail on that here in just a minute. Busted. As soon as Debbie realized what was going on, she knew exactly who was doing it. She didn't understand why. She still has, if she knows why now, I don't feel like she fully knows or she hasn't fully accepted it because I could not get a why. During my reading, and I know it was short, I could not get a why. So maybe I'll do another reading soon 
and try to figure out a why, but she just, she knew who it was and how it was set up. Her truth will be told in justice. And then the last words that I heard was be honest, Amanda. That's why I said back over here, she wants Amanda to step up. She wants Amanda to be honest. She wants Amanda to step up and tell the truth. Now, this last little part down here at the bottom of gathered. Who heads up. This is graphic. Okay. I'm a very visual person. And I hope that I describe this the same way that I saw it. Amanda set Debbie up. Allegedly. This is all allegedly. Everything in my reading is all allegedly in my opinion until proven otherwise by factual evidence provided by law enforcement. So allegedly, Amanda set Debbie up to meet her, to give her the items that she had just purchased at Family Dollar to clean her apartment. All of the items that were found at the crime scene, the tarp and the poncho, I believe were purchased for the game, but the paper towel, um, the lighter, the other things, I believe those were purchased for Amanda. Though That's what they talked about on the phone when Amanda and Debbie spoke on the phone earlier in the afternoon. Remember, I, I said something about that, but during the presser, the detective wasn't for sure the exact time because he didn't have his notes in front of him. That is the phone call where I believe Amanda asked Debbie to stop and get her items at the Family Dollar on the way to meet her at that location and she would meet her there to get those items from her allegedly but Andrew was there instead of Amanda Debbie was shocked she was in fear she tried to escape and she kept getting stopped and blocked he caught her shirt on fire I believe that's why she was partially burned on the abdomen I believe that he tried to burn her and she was able to remove her shirt. <sighs> I need a second. Ooh, okay, I'm sorry. All right, so I saw Debbie's look of fear on her face. I saw her, t her small brown eyes and her blonde hair and <sighs> I, the look of fear on her face. I saw that. I also saw her fighting with her shirt. I saw Debbie ripping her red jersey off while it was on fire. And you can see a piece of it here in the pictures of the crime scene. I felt pain in the back of my neck on the left side. But then I also felt it on the right side. It wasn't right in the middle. It was worse on the left. And emotionally... I felt fear, frantic, trapped. I mean, those words, I cannot express those words enough. I felt trapped. I, I, I can't even put it into words, the fear that I felt. Okay, and, and there's different types of fear, right? Like, it, it, intense fear, okay? Imagine the fear that you would feel if you were standing in the face of somebody that you had a little bit of fear of anyway, and you knew that they were about to murder you, but you did not know how. You didn't know if they were going to stab you, if they were going to beat you. If, you don't know. Okay, that's the fear that she felt. She tried to get away. She couldn't get away. She fought. She did fight. And she was frantically trying to get away unsuccessfully. And that is my reading. And I have taken enough of your time today. And I appreciate if you made it all the way to the end of this video. Thank you so very much. This was not an easy reading today to, to go over to explain. It was not an easy reading to do yesterday. I like to validate my dates here. Okay, you can see today is Saturday, October 1st. It is 6.41 p.m. right now. I started recording this video about an hour and 20 minutes ago. I, I felt a push for some reason. 
to get this information out. And I don't know exactly why. And I could be totally wrong. There's always a possibility that I'm totally wrong. And then there's that possibility that I'm totally right. Time will tell. Evidence will tell. Law enforcement, they already know. I believe, in my opinion, law enforcement already knows what the, the finished puzzle looks like. Now they're just trying to fit all those pieces in where they go. And I hope so. I hope they find every single piece and I hope it fits perfectly. And I hope that they don't have that one missing piece that they need to solve that puzzle. I hope that they find it. I hope they have it. And I hope that justice is served. And from my reading, justice will be served. I heard the word justice. I hope that that means that it's because Amanda spoke up and did this for her mommy. Because her mommy was there for her way more than she should have been. And Amanda knows that. If Amanda hears this, she'll know exactly what I mean. There were many times, in my opinion, there were many times that Debbie helped Amanda when she shouldn't have. She enabled Amanda, but she did it because she loves her daughter. It's her baby girl, and she will always love her daughter. Even now, right now, she still loves her daughter. She wants her to come forward. She wants her to be honest and tell the truth. So thank you so much for watching. Leave your comments below. What do you think? Do you think I'm wrong? Do you think I'm right? Did I miss something? Is there something else that could be said that needs to be said that I missed that was off? Leave it in your comment below. And until next time, I love you bunches.